I'm uh, Lee Bollinger, President of uh, Columbia. Hi, Joel. I want to welcome all of you to this New York City Global Partners Summit on urban education, and especially the representatives from 26 cities and 18 different nations who have traveled to Columbia to be here with us this morning. We are happy to be joined on campus once again by Mayor Michael Bloomberg and Marjorie Tiven, a board member and director of the New York City Global Partners. She's also an alumna of Columbia's School of Social Work. In many different quarters, there is talk today about globalization, the forces it has unleashed and the consequences for society. In the academic community, we are mindful that with each passing year, globalization is increasing the complexity of the problems we seek to understand. Columbia University, along with all of our peer institutions, is committed to developing the resources needed to meet the challenges. Only by doing so will we be able to continue to advance the frontiers of knowledge, which is the central mission of our universities. Any listing of the subjects affected by globalization typically includes the environment, climate change, the economy, financial regulation, the study of infectious disease, and other public health issues. And this Global Partners Initiative recognizes that at its core, globalization is an engine of urbanization throughout the world and that we have to learn how to better govern our cities in order to succeed as a global society. Too rarely, though, do we consider the ways in which globalization should be changing how we educate our children. Today's Urban Education Summit proves beyond any doubt that by looking to the experience of other nations and other cities, educators can find a rich and virtually inexhaustible source of innovative ideas and practices. It is a resource that must be tapped if we are to maximize gains in K through 12 education. And when we think about the problems affecting the economies in this country and throughout the world, by far and away the most important thing we can do is to build the minds of our children. Columbia is affiliated with Teachers College, which was a little more than ahead of the curve in recognizing the value of international work because in 1899 it began a program on comparative and international studies in education. Columbia's engagement in New York City's public schools is broader than Teachers College, however, and we have acknowledged leadership which goes beyond the historic role of a local Ivy University where generations of talented, talented New York City public school graduates like Joel Klein could get on the subway in Brooklyn, Queens and the Bronx and take a vital intellectual step on their journey to this campus. And you already know about Esther Fuchs and how engaged she is with educational policy. She's joined by other faculty members around here known for their expertise as scholars and researchers on educational reform. The fact that New York City's public school system is the largest in the United States with approximately 1.1 million students and nearly 1,700 schools is well known. But to appreciate the scale of New York City's school system, consider that the population of students in the city public schools would constitute on its own the 10th largest city in the United States. To reform this staggeringly large and diverse public school system, Mayor Bloomberg and Chancellor Joel Klein, a Columbia alumnus, and I should add a recipient of an honorary degree this past May, have for eight years committed themselves to the arduous path of innovation. Their reforms have been discussed, passionately debated, and frequently emulated in other cities around the nation and around the world. 
This is the fourth consecutive year that Columbia has co-hosted a summit with the New York City Global Partners, a collaboration, a series of conferences which we value greatly. Mayor Feldberg, who for 15 years served as Dean of Columbia's Business School and is one of the most outstanding as deans of anyone I know, and who is now president of the New York City Global Partners, has been and remains at the heart of this collaboration. And so too is Professor Esther Fuchs of Columbia School of Public and International Affairs, whom I recognized a moment ago. And I want to recognize them, thank them, along with the others at New York City Global City, City New York City Global Partners, the Office of the Mayor, and here at Columbia, all the people who have worked so hard to put on this summit on urban education. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mayor Feldberg. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank my colleague and friend, President Lee Bollinger, for once again inviting us to his home. This is probably one of the greatest spaces in New York City, and it is always a privilege and an honor to be in Lowe, as it is known around the campus. This conference, this event, as you heard from Lee Bollinger, is the fourth consecutive event that Columbia University has hosted. We thank them. Uh, we don't take for granted all they do for the city, and we also think the city does a great deal for Columbia University. It is an extraordinarily synergistic relationship. I would also like to welcome this morning some of the board members of New York City Global Partners, Marjorie Tiven, who has already been mentioned, and former Mayor David Dinkins is here. We're delighted to see you, Mr. Mayor. Veronica Kelly is here today, and we're very happy to have her with us as well. Uh, my task this morning is to introduce the uh, mayor of our city, Mike Bloomberg, who is now in his ninth year. Before I do so, I would like to make one observation that came out of last night's reception. I was talking to the deputy mayor of the city of Antwerp. He was at last year's conference, which was devoted to job creation in urban areas. He said it was so beneficial that he came back this year for the education summit, and in fact, when he went back last year, they made some changes in the city of Antwerp to the way in which they were administering and running their job creation programs. So it's always good to have confirmation that these programs really do have an impact and really do work, and we're delighted to see so many cities back again. So who do we have here today? We have Antwerp and Buenos Aires, Delhi and Edinburgh, Edmonton, Helsinki and Hong Kong, Jerusalem, London and Luxembourg. Manila, Mexico City, and Montreal, New York City, Quebec City, Rio de Janeiro, Rome, Sao Paulo, Shanghai, Singapore, Taipei, Tel Aviv, Toronto, and Tokyo, a truly global event. With those brief observations, let me now introduce the 108th mayor of New York City, and I would like to do so with a number. And the number is that during the past year, New York City has accounted for 10% of the nation's job growth. I say again, in the past year, New York City has accounted for 10% of the nation's job growth. And of course, this doesn't happen by accident. It requires an enormous amount of vision, an enormous amount of leadership, and the capacity to execute. And one of the defining success factors in, in Mayor Bloomberg's administration has been the capacity to take a vision, turn it into a strategy, and actually execute it, get it done. The mayor understands the end game, and the end game is making it all work, and he has done so extraordinarily well. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, the educational machinery that, that has been built and created in the city under the leadership of the mayor and Joel Klein. I also want to mention very briefly, if the mayor doesn't mind, that in 1981, he founded a company with one person, namely himself, called Bloomberg PLC. Over the course of the past 30 years, Bloomberg PLC has probably employed, in and out, maybe 40, 50,000 people, has probably supported four, 500,000 people in a pretty direct way around the world. The company operates in 160 
cities around the world. So we're talking about a mayor who actually has executed on an enormous scale and on a global scale prior to becoming mayor of New York City. Now when we talk about education, particularly K through 12, we tend to focus very much on the students, on the teachers, and on the parents. In many ways, the end game, in fact, is the graduates. The students will be students for 12 years. They'll be graduates for 75 years. And the ultimate success, the ultimate test, the proof in the, of the pudding, is how successful the graduates are when they come out of the New York City school system. And I think that, that, that it's clear to everybody who has been involved that each year over the course of the past nine years, the quality of the graduating class has improved. And each year the graduating class comes into the city, starts jobs, start jobs, starts entre start entrepreneurial programs, work in the public sector, and each year they enhance the quality of the intellectual property and intellectual capacity in the city and help the city move forward. So it is all about the graduates, but in order for that to be a success, you have to have an extraordinarily successful K through 12 program. So a couple of data points, and then uh, we'll ask the mayor to come up and talk to us. Before Mayor Bloomberg came to office, New York City's graduation rate had been flat for more than a decade. In the past five years, the graduation rate has increased by 27%. Mayor Bloomberg has also been a leader together with Joel Klein in moving the city to a point at which parents and students have far more choice in the schools they can attend through the charter school system and through the vision schools that have been created. Mayor Bloomberg has also provided an enormous amount of additional support for the teachers and teacher salaries since he has been mayor have grown by 43%, that is 43% since 2002. Under Mayor Bloomberg, New York City students have made significant progress on National Assessment of Educational Progress, that's the NAEP test, which is considered to be the gold standard test. And under Mayor Bloomberg, and also under Ray Kelly, whose wife, Mrs. Kelly, is on the board of New York City Global Partners, crime in New York City schools has dropped dramatically. So with those brief observations, I would like to invite the 108th mayor of New York City to address us on urban education, K through 12. Well, I, I can't uh, not make the obvious joke from one mayor to another. Um, I thought it was actually funnier than that. Uh, but anyways, Mayor, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, it is, uh, it's great to be back here at one of the jewels in the educational crown of New York City. And uh, I also wanted to thank you for working with our city's commission for the United Nations, Consular Corps and Protocol, headed by my sister, uh, Commissioner Marjorie Tiven, and also the New York City Department of Education in organizing this Global Partners Summit. Let me acknowledge the organizations that have provided support for this summer because the summit, because without them we couldn't do it. Uh, Pearson, Bank of America, the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City, and of course our host, Columbia University, led by its wonderful president, Lee Bollinger, and the entire Columbia community. And while I cannot claim that I ever got a degree from Columbia University, uh, my sister has it, uh, Diana Taylor has two degrees from Columbia. Um, it is a Columbia family, whether I like it or not. Uh, my allegiances, incidentally, are to a small school in Baltimore, but we'll let that go for the time being. Uh, also, I did want to thank um, Esther Fuchs, uh, Professor Esther Fuchs, for uh, moderating this morning's panel on uh, in, uh, international uh, school uh, from the uh, school of, uh, Esther's from the School of International uh, uh, and Public Affairs. And for four years, Esther was my advisor in City Hall. Uh, in that capacity, she never let me down. She always had advice for me, and it was always special and sometimes I actually even followed it. Not often. 
Uh, on behalf of the City of New York, I also wanted to welcome the delegates from 26 cities and 18 nations who are attending this summit. Now, I must confess that if back in my school teachers, in my school days, uh, you told the school teachers in Medford, Massachusetts, that someday Mike Bloomberg, of all people, would be addressing a group like this uh, from around the world about improving education, they would not have believed their ears. Uh, and that's because they knew me as the kind of student who usually made the top half of the class possible. <laughs> I'll wait for a second to see if the translators can figure out a ways to express that in other languages. Uh, but since those days, uh, all kidding aside, I've become um, more of a, uh, developed my appreciation of just how important education is in our world. Uh, I know of no social problem that we have that wouldn't be ameliorated or eliminated if we had better public schools, and that has to be where our focus is. It is the future of our city, it is the future of our state, it is the future of our country, and in fact it is the future of the world. And all of our children, uh, no matter where they are, no matter what their background is, uh, deserve a great public education, and if we don't give them that, we will all suffer. Uh, from Helsinki to Hong Kong, from Manila to Montreal, the cities represented in this summit, I think, offer striking contrast to one another in climate and in geography and in history and in culture. But they also have something in common, and that's what's brought us here today. Uh, all of them recognize that those who dare to teach must also always be willing to learn. And our schools today have to embrace change because in every corner of the globe, our schools all confront two historic challenges. The first is posed by the economic realities that we all face, and because the world's economy continues to be transformed in ways that have profound implications for education. As Lou Gerstner, the former CEO of American Express and IBM, recently commented, most jobs that will have good prospects in the future will be complicated. They will involve being able to juggle data, symbols, and computer programs no matter what the task. And no matter where we're from, those words ring true for all of us. Now the path to security and prosperity for the people we serve in every nation represented here today runs straight through the classroom, and that's what I want to talk about. The second great challenge for our schools is demographic. Today, for the first time in the long history of life on Earth, the majority of the world's people are city dwellers. And by the year 2050, fully three-fourths of the people on Earth are expected to be living in cities. And as a result, in cities everywhere on the globe, whether our population are growing because of immigration or in migration, our schools will now all face a similar and enormous task, preparing vastly increased numbers of new students, often the children of parents who are themselves newcomers to city life, to succeed in an increasingly globalized, urbanized world. This summit focuses on ways to help our schools meet these historic challenges, and that includes exploring innovative approaches to teaching, seeing how others have succeeded in turning around historically low-performing schools, and looking at new ways to prepare students for the demands of colleges or careers. We just cannot continue to do things in education the way we did them 100 years ago. There is no other part of society where we do that. And we've got to make sure that we, responsible for education, whether we're the teacher in the classroom in front of the child, which in the end is the way we deliver the service and the m number one key in making sure that child learns, or people all the way up through the taxpayers that are paying for it. We just have to be willing to try new things because we are living in a different world. Now we all have a lot to learn. Uh, Americans, I've always thought, perhaps more than others. Many of us can remember when the educational system of the United States was the envy of the world, but we recognize that America's scholastic standing has now slipped badly and we've got to focus on that and understand what's happened to us and make sure that we stop that trend. Today we find America's students ranked 20th in the world in high school graduation rates, 21st in science, and 25th in math. And while other nations have raced ahead expecting more of their students and teachers, 
uh, expecting more from their students and teachers, America has stood still, even though we've been spending far more than anybody else in the whole world and cutting, cutting class size far below what it used to be. Now, let me be clear. We don't begrudge the great successes that schools elsewhere, including some of your schools, have had. You have earned it. On the contrary, we want to learn from you and do even better. That's what America's all about. We don't begrudge success. We want to make sure that everybody succeeds. And it is what built this country. And that kind of single-minded devotion to improving education has characterized our administration since we came into office back in 2002. When we started, New York City school system was widely considered to be one of the worst in the nation, one that year after year utterly failed to educate too many of our children. And the key reason for that failure was evident to all. It was a governance structure that segmented authority over schools so that local officials were effectively shielded from being held accountable for school performance. Well, it's true in business, it's true in government, it's true in every field. When there is no accountability, here's what you inevitably get. Lousy results and no reason to improve them. So as a first step, we campaigned hard to gain authority for our state leaders to assume control of and accountability for New York City's public schools themselves. And there's somebody sitting in this room who deserves an enormous amount of credit for actually helping us to achieve it. It is the 106th mayor of the city of New York, David Dinkins. And he, with his predecessor, Ed Koch, and his successor, Rudy Giuliani, the three of them, worked very hard to get mayoral control enacted. Joel and I were the beneficiaries of coming along at the right time, but you know, we build on those before us, and we've stood on their shoulders. And without the work of all three of those, we never would have gotten this done. When we finally got this control of the schools, we seized it as an opportunity to make dramatic and fundamental changes. And in the process, it's fair to say that we have transformed our school system from one of the nation's worst to one that President Obama's administration has identified as a model for cities in the rest of America. That transformation rests on a new culture of accountability. It's the basis for all of the reforms that, with the visionary and vigorous leadership of schools Chancellor Joel Klein, we have instituted. For example, when schools have chronically failed to help students advance scholastically, we've closed them down. We've given greater authority to principals, including the authority to decide what works and what doesn't work in their individual schools with the student body that they have and the physical resources that they have. We've ended the pr practice of social promotion, which for years moved children up a grade even if they hadn't mastered the necessary skills to do the grade that they were in. What a tragedy. A child is falling behind and we put them into a more difficult environment. What would any of us do if we sat there and just totally understood that we didn't understand anything going on at the head of the class? We stopped that process. It was controversial, but today I think people would look back and say if it wasn't for Joel's idea and if we didn't get that done, we could not make most of the progress that we have made. And by encouraging the creation of hundreds of new academically challenging schools, including charter schools, we've introduced greater competition into the entire school system. That makes all of the schools stand or fall on the results they produce and challenge them to do even better. About six months ago, U.S. News & World Report listed the 100 best public high schools in the country. And I'm happy to say 12 were New York City public high schools. In the entire country, we got 12% right here with 3% of the country's population. The graduation rates, as uh, Mayor said, or Lee said, uh, that were once stagnant have gone up every single year. They are 27% higher than they were four years ago compared to just a 3% rise among students who face the same requirements in the rest of our state. Our African American and Hispanic students have substantially narrowed the achievement gap that for far too long has separated them from their white and Asian counterparts. A shameful fact, I'm pleased to say, that we have helped to change. We still have a long ways to go. But when you compare the students within the state who all take the same tests, I don't know whether the tests are harder or easier. It's not worth having that debate. 
they all take the same tests, and so these comparisons are a very fair ways to measure it. And by any standard, New York City students have done better than the rest of the state, and by any standards, we have, de we have cut substantially into that disgraceful gap that has been existing for far too long when people just threw up their hands and says, that's where it is, and there's nothing we can do about it. Now, I said we still have a long ways to go because, for example, even while our graduation rates have climbed dramatically, it's still the case that more than a third of our students don't complete high school within four years, and too many who do graduate still lack the academic skills they need for success. Let me also point out that another thing we've been able to do, while not every child can get through high school in four years, the number of children who are staying around for a fifth and sixth year rather than dropping out has gone up substantially as well. And in many senses, that's what I think we should be most proud of. Not everybody learn, learns at the same pace. Not everybody has the same social support at home or the freedom to go to school every day. But if a child cares enough to stand around and work as hard as they can, stay around and work as hard as they can, and graduate in five or six years, my hat's off to them. Too many of our graduates, however, still lack the academic skills they need for success in the real world. And so to build on our achievements today, we have now set this goal, making sure that all our students leave school ready for college or careers. College is not right for everyone. Sometimes maybe you'll go back later on. Sometimes economic necessities force you to go to work to support your family. That's what America's about. It's about people taking responsibility and working. And I've made sure that our next school's chancellor, Kathy Black, comes to our Department of Education with the top flight management experience and skills that qualify her superbly to guide this effort. Joel and I worked very hard to find somebody who can take what Joel's done and carry it on. And when this administration finishes the end of 2013, We've got to make sure that we as citizens of New York, citizens of this state, citizens of America, citizens of the world, make sure that all of the changes that we've made, all of the improvements that we've made, don't get turned around and go back to where we came from. We cannot do that for our students. We owe them more. We have to make sure that every teacher in every classroom is an excellent teacher. New York City has blessed with, is blessed with 80 thousand teachers. It's an astonishing number, and most do a phenomenal job. In fact, as our schools have improved, new teachers have been flocking here from across the nation because they want to be part of the success story being written in New York City. We want them very much because we know that the most significant factor affecting any student's performance is the quality of his or her teacher. Yet, I'm sad to say, unlike in other professions, teaching is still organized on what might be called a factory model, with teachers, regardless of their mastery, rewarded primarily for their longevity on the job. And to alter that, we're reforming how we award teacher tenure, which is a vital career-long guarantee of job security. For many years, teachers were granted tenure automatically by default. Instead, it should be an honor earned for outstanding achievement. The rest of us have to face that kind of competition and accountability in everything else we do. And society demands that we do it in perhaps the most important endeavor that we are engaged in, educating the future of our world. So within the next few weeks, we'll present teachers and principals in our public schools, we think with a new, fair, and detailed framework for how teachers' tenure decisions will be made. It's a process that will focus on teacher effectiveness and helping students learn and grow over the course of the year, especially struggling students for whom English is not their first language and students with learning disabilities. We live in a very complex world. We live in a global world. We have a lot of students who join our school system. They come here from around the world and they don't speak English. And it's up to us to make sure they still get an education. We have a lot of students who come here who aren't blessed with a big, stable family that can support them. We have to make sure that they have opportunities and get the support in the school system that they should be getting at home, but just by the luck of the draw, don't. We have to make sure that every student, no matter what hand God dealt them, in terms of abilities, physical, mental, whatever, gets a chance to participate in the great American dream. And we will 
continue to improve the school system, continue to improve the quality of teachers, work with the parents, do everything we can. We have budget problems like everybody else. We will find a ways to make sure that there is a great teacher in front of every child in our school system. We owe the world at least that. And we're going to help our teachers enhance their careers, enhance their abilities. We are not going to fail, and our teachers are not going to fail. This morning, many thousands of parents across the city woke up well before dawn to make breakfast, lay out clean clothes, and get their children ready for a new school day. They took their children's hand in theirs, and they guided them to the schoolhouse doors, sometimes with an hour or an hour and a half subway ride. There are students that have to take a subway and a bus and a boat to get to the school that they want to go to. But when I talk to parents on the subway in the morning, the parents, no matter how long their commute, every single one of them looks me in the eye and says, thank you for improving our school system. My child is into the most wonderful school in the city. And I say, how long is your commute? Oh, it's only an hour and a half. If that's the sacrifice parents have to make to get their children into a great school, that's what they do. It is our responsibility to, once the parent drops the child off at the schoolhouse door, leaving their children in our trust, to make sure that we do our part. And each day, scenes like I've described get played out in our cities. That means we have an enormous responsibility, a responsibility to do the utmost for children. They are our future. And it's really that simple and that profound, and it's also that exhilarating because it means it is in the power of our hands to make an enormous difference and ensure that the best days for the cities that we live in, the countries that we live in and love, the world that gives us opportunities will have a great future. It's why our teachers have to be held accountable. It's why you and I have to be held accountable. And it's why we have to find new ways to do our best. And that's what this summit is really all about. So from those of you from elsewhere, outside the city, uh, around the world, or across the country, uh, do two things for me. Uh, most importantly is try to share ideas with each other because we all can learn from each other. And number two, please spend some money in the stores here. We need the sales tax revenues to pay for our educational system. Enjoy your stay in the city, and thank you.